becomes the new Attorney General William Barr before the subcommittee. As the Attorney General during the George H. W. Bush administration before the subcommittee. As the Attorney General during the George H. W. Bush administration, he has testified before this committee in the past, but this is his first time in quite a while. Welcome and congratulations to your new and old positions, sir. We also welcome Assistant Attorney General for Administration Lee Loftus because Attorney General Barr was not confirmed when this year's budget proposal was largely formulated. He has asked that the Assistant Attorney All we have is your four-page summary, which seems to cherry-pick from the report to draw the most favorable conclusion possible for the President. And in many ways, your letter raises more question than it answers. I must say, it is extraordinary to evaluate how well, my constituents do as well. I understand that portions of it must be redacted as a matter of law, but my hope is that you will stop there and bring transparency to this process as soon as possible. The American people deserve the facts. Now, to your five FY20 budget request. The request provides a significant increase for immigration judges and a modest increase for most federal law enforcement. However, it either eliminates or significantly cuts respected grant programs at the Department of Justice that really make a difference in our constituents' daily lives. For example, your request significantly decreases essential programs, including the COPS program, which advances community policing on a state and local level would be cut by $205 million. The DNA Initiative Program, which provides grants to reduce the rape kit backlog by ensuring evidence that could lead to meaningful convictions, does not sit on forgotten shelves, and that would be cut by $25 million. And the Juvenile Justice Program, which helps prevent youth crime, violence, and reduce recidivism, which would be cut by $48.5 million. These are simply unacceptable reductions. I look forward to a productive discussion today. Hope you can shed some light on how this budget request can adequately respond to the grave task the Department of Justice and its grant programs undertake daily. Thank you again for appearing before us. I look forward to an open discussion, an honest discussion, and address the many challenges before us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, uh, Attorney General Barr, you are recognized to give your opening statement. We ask you please to try to keep it to five minutes and your whole uh, statement will be included in the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chair, and, and Ranking Member Adderholt. I'm pleased to be here today to present to you the President's fiscal year 2000, uh, 2020 budget for the Department of Justice. And I'm joined here today by the Department's Chief Financial Officer, Assistant Attorney General, uh, for administration, Lee Loftus. We look forward to discussing how our requested appropriations will help protect the safety and rights uh, of our constituents and your constituents. For two fiscal years in a row, the Department has broken records for prosecuting violent crime. The Department has also significantly increased prosecution of firearm offenses, and in fiscal year 2018, prosecuted more firearm defendants than ever before. As prosecutions have gone up, crime has gone down, and in 2017, after two years of increases, violent crime and homicide rates went down nationwide. 
The FBI's preliminary data for the first six months of 2018 show a 4.3 percent decline in violent crime overall and a 6.7 percent decline in murders and a 12 percent decline in robbery and burglary compared to the first six months of 2017. In order to continue this momentum, President Trump has requested an additional $137 million for violent crime and transnational organized crime prosecutions, as well as a, an additional $100 million for the Project Safe Neighborhood grants to state and local law enforcement. The department also requests $5.8 million to enhance violent crime and firearms prosecutions. Over the first two years of the Trump administration, we have also gained ground against the op opioid epidemic, which is by far the deadliest drug crisis that this country has ever faced. The department increased the number of defendants charged with federal opioid-related crimes by 28 percent from fiscal year 2017 to fiscal year 2018. Prescriptions of the seven most frequently abused prescription opioids are down more than 23 percent since 2016 to the lowest level in at least a decade. And over the same period, the DEA has lowered the legal limits on production of the active ingredients in these opioids by 47 percent. More importantly, drug overdose deaths may have finally stopped rising. According to preliminary data from the CDC, overdose deaths decreased slightly from September 2017 to August 2018. But there's a lot more work to be done. And that is why the President's budget provides for $295 million to combat the opioid epidemic, including $18.2 million for the FBI's Joint Criminal Opioid Darknet Enforcement Initiative, or J-Code, which is a team of agents that work to disrupt and dismantle the sale of synthetic opioids on the darknet. The President requests $11.1 million for five new heroin enforcement groups that will be deployed to DEA field divisions that have identified heroin as the first or second greatest threat in their area. The President also includes $2 million in operational funds for the National Opioid Initiative of our OSADEF program. The President's budget also proposes to permanently transfer $254 million from the White House Office of, the Na of National Drug Control Policy to the DEA for the HIDA area programs, the high-intensity drug trafficking areas. This change will eliminate redundancies by placing this program under the agency that leads our drug enforcement efforts. We know that most of the illicit drugs in this country came across our southern border. In the fight against an unprecedented drug crisis, border security is imperative. In fiscal year 2018, the Department charged more defendants with illegal entry into this country than in any year before. At the same time, the Department increased the number of felony illegal reentry prosecutions by more than 38 percent. Our immigration courts, which are under the Department of Justice, have also become more productive under the administration. Since the beginning of 2017, the Department has conducted an unprecedented surge in hiring immigration judges. The Department has hired more immigration judges under President Trump than in the previous seven years combined. We now employ the largest number of immigration judges in history, with 46 percent more immigration judges than just three years ago. That is having an impact on immigration cases. After eight consecutive years of declining or stagnant productivity between fiscal year 2009 and fiscal year 2016, our immigration judges have increased case completions two years in a row. In fiscal year 2018, immigration judges completed the most cases in seven years. In order to continue this progress, the Department requests $71 million for 100 new immigration judges and additional support staff in fiscal year 2020. This would bring the number of authorized immigration judges to 634, which would more than double the number of immigration judges on board in fiscal year 2016. Given the fact that these judges face a record-breaking 860,000 case backlog, this investment is more than warranted. 
And with the crisis on our southwest border, the department requests $6 million for our southwest border rural law enforcement violence crime reduction initiative, which will help law enforcement agencies serving rural areas along and near the border to fight rural crime. The department also plays a critical role in protecting our national security and combating terrorism and cybercrime. And that is why the President requests an additional $70.5 million to enhance the FBI's cyber information sharing abilities and cyber tools capabilities, as well as $16 million for our National Vetting Center. The President requests an additional $18 million for the FBI to address counterintelligence threats, particularly cyber attacks and threats from hostile foreign intelligence services. Mr. Chairman, there are many other issues facing law enforcement that we could talk about today, but the bottom line is the more than 112,000 men and women at the Department of Justice are doing important work, and we ask for your support. Thank you. Attorney General Barr, in your confirmation hearings, you said you believed it very important that results of the special counsel Mueller's investigation be shared with Congress and the public. We agree on that. FBI Director Ray, the nation's top counterintelligence investigator, told us last week he had not read the special counsel's report. So my question is, with regard to your March 24th and 29th letters to the Judiciary Committees, did Special Counsel Mueller or anyone in his team, on his team, have a role in drafting them or reviewing them in advance? Did you use any of the summary documents prepared by the Special Counsel in drafting these documents? The 24th and 29th. Um, we, on the, the letter of the 24th, uh, Mr. Mueller's team did not play a role in drafting that uh, document, although we offered him the opportunity to review it before we sent it out, and he declined that. Uh, the letter on the 29th, I don't believe that that was reviewed by Mr. Mueller or that they participated in drafting that letter. But to go back to something you said in your opening statement about the availability of the report, as I've said, as you pointed out, since my confirmation, I do think it's important that the public have an opportunity to, to, to learn the results of, the, of uh, the special counsel's work. And I said then that I would work diligently to make as much information uh, public as I could and available to Congress as I could. You will recognize that I'm operating under a regulation that uh, was put together during the Clinton administration and does not provide for the publication of the report. But I am uh, relying on my own discretion uh, to make as much public as I can. Now, in my letter of the t March 29th, I identified four areas that I feel should be redacted, and I think most people would agree. The first is grand jury information, 6E material. The second is information that the, ICE, the intelligence community believes would reveal intelligence sources and methods. The third uh, are information in the report that could interfere with ongoing prosecutions. Uh, you will recall that uh, the special counsel did spin off a number of cases that are still being pursued, and we want to make sure that none of the information in the report would impinge upon either the ability of the prosecutors to prosecute the cases or the fairness to the defendants. And finally, uh, uh, we uh, intend to redact information uh, that implicates the privacy or reputational interests of peripheral players where there is a decision not to charge them. Uh, right now, the special counsel is working with us on identifying information in the reports that fall under those four categories. We will color code the excisions from the report and we will provide explanatory notes describing the basis uh, for each redaction. So, for example, if a redaction is made because of a court order in a pending prosecution, we'll state that and we will, dis we will uh, distinguish between the various categories. This process is going along uh, very well, and uh, my original timetable uh, 
of being able to release this uh, uh, by mid April stands. And so I, I think that uh, from my standpoint, uh, by the by uh, within a week, uh, I will be in a position to release the port to the public, and then I will uh, engage with the chairman of both judiciary committees about that report and about any further requests that they have. So let me just get one thing clear for the record. Uh, my concern during my opening statement that when you redact something, we should know what area falls under that you say will happen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your March 24th letter indicated that some actions the special counsel investigated as potentially raising obstruction of justice's concerns had not been publicly reported. Will these actions be identified in the report sent to Congress? Uh, as things stand now, I, I don't think that they will be redacted, so they will be identifiable. All right. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Adderhall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, uh, as you know, there is a serious humanitarian crisis at the southern border. Uh, in fact, the previous administration explicitly noted that transnational organized crime in Mexico makes the U.S. border more vulnerable because it creates and maintains illicit corridors of border crossings that can be employ employed by other secondary criminal or terrorist actors or organizations. Uh, of course, the, uh, your FY 2020 budget proposes an additional $18 million in resources. Uh, to help advance the fight against transnational organized crime. Uh, can you talk a bit about Department of Justice and how it is addressing the smuggling networks that are endangering a, so many of the lives that are being smuggled and trafficked across the southern border, and particularly the children? Yes, sir. The, um, the problem we face on our southern border uh, is... is uh, really unprecedented, not just the, the volume and the makeup of the people coming across from an immigration policy standpoint, but by the strength of the criminal organizations in Mexico. One of the things that has uh, changed a lot in the 30 years before, uh, prior uh, where, when I was attorney general has been the strengthening of these criminal organizations in Mexico, these cartels that are not only getting, not only involved in multiple uh, kinds of drugs and the transportation of those drugs into the, and distribution in the United States, but also into human trafficking. Um, so attacking those transnational criminal organizations is a high priority. The FY 2020 budget requests in uh, a total of $3.2 billion that is targeted at dealing with these transnational organizations. And we're, incre we're seeking an increase of $109 million this year. Uh, the, um, we're also seeking $29 million in programmatic uh, enhancements, including $18 million to strengthen the FBI's ability to monitor and target the transnational uh, organizations, and $10 million to strengthen DEA's ability to operate its judicial wire intercept program in Central America, uh, and another uh, $1.7 million for DEA's sensitive intelligence unit, which is targeting uh, these groups and their illicit uh, trafficking in, in narcotics. Uh, I personally believe that an important part of securing the southern border uh, is to have a barrier system uh, on the border. And uh, I think that that will help not only in narcotics interdiction, but also in suppressing human trafficking. And uh, it's an important part of uh, our enforcement. Let me uh, switch gears just a minute. One of the most sacred rights, as you know, is uh, Americans is the right not to be spied on by the government. Uh, uh, a FISA order may only be issued based on a finding by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that probable cause exists to believe that the target of surveillance is an agent of a foreign power. Uh, one of our colleagues, Representative Nunez, has referred eight persons 
to the FBI for investigation concerning alleged misconduct during the Russia investigation, including the leak of highly classified material and alleged conspiracies uh, to lie to Congress and the uh, FISA court in order to spy on then-candidate Trump and uh, other persons. I would hope the Department of Justice will be giving these referrals appropriate and uh, prompt consideration. Uh, my question is, now that President Trump has been exonerated of Russia collu collu collusion, is the Justice Department investigating how it came uh, to be that your agency used a salacious and unverified dossier as a predicate uh, for a FISA order on a U.S. citizen? <clears throat> the Office uh, of the Inspector General has a pending investigation of the FISA process in, in the Russian investigation, and I expect that that will be complete in probably in May or June, I am told. So uh, hopefully we'll have some answers from uh, Inspector General Horowitz on the issue of the FISA warrants. More gen Go ahead. More generally, uh, I am reviewing the conduct of the investigation and trying to get my arms around all the, the aspects of the uh, counterintelligence investigation that was conducted during the summer of 2016. Are you investigating who leaked the existence of the FISA order against Carter Page? Uh, who what? Uh, are, you, are you investigating who leaked the existence of a FISA order against Carter Page? Um, I haven't seen the, the referrals yet from uh, Congressman Nunez, but obviously if, if there's a predicate for an investigation, it'll be conducted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Lowy. Attorney General Barr, reports suggest that Special Counsel Mueller's report is anywhere between 300 and 400 pages long. I'd be interested in knowing how many discussions did you have with the Deputy Attorney General and other staff between receiving the report and releasing the memo? Was there discussion or debate about the evidence and conclusions? How many staffers assisted you in digesting so many pages of complex information in such a short period of time? Let me tell you what I'm getting at that I find quite extraordinary. You received a very serious, detailed report, hundreds of pages of high-level information, weighed the factors and conclusions at length, outlined, prepared, edited, and released your memo in less than 48 hours. To me, to do this, it seems your mind must have been already made up. How did you do it? The thinking of the uh, special counsel uh, was not a mystery to the people at the Department of Justice uh, prior to his submission of the report. He had been interacting, he and his people had been interacting with the Deputy Attorney General and, and lawyers supporting the Deputy Attorney General in his supervision of the special counsel. And in that context, there had been discussions. So there was some inkling as to some of the thinking of the special counsel. Uh, furthermore, on uh, March 5th, I believe, uh, the deputy and I met with uh, special counsel Mueller and his team and had a preliminary discussion about the report. So we had uh, an inkling as to what was coming our direction. Uh, and so uh, even more thinking uh, within the department was done about that over that time. That was a matter of weeks. Uh, and then when the report came, and it came approximately midday on Friday, uh, the Deputy Attorney General and I uh, and our staffs worked uh, closely for uh, the balance of that day, uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt you. That's Did the White House see the report before you released your summarizing letter? Has the White House seen it since then? Have they been briefed on the contents beyond what was in your summarizing letter to the Judiciary Committee? Um, 
I've said what I'm going to say about the report today. Uh, I've, I've issued three letters about it, and I'm, I was willing to discuss uh, the historic information of how the report came to me and my decision on Sunday. But I've already laid out the process that is going forward uh, to release these reports, uh, hopefully uh, within a week. And I'm not going to say anything more about it until the report is out and everyone has a chance to look at it. I think there are some relevant questions that I do hope you could answer today, sir. On the question of obstruction of justice, your memo stated, quote, while this report does not conclude that the president committed a crime, it also does not exonerate him. Yet President Trump has publicly stated that this report is a complete and total exoneration. Can you tell us who is factually accurate? And will the release report include details on the obstruction issue? And why, as you noted, the president is not exonerated, or will that information be redacted? I've already explained the information that's going to be redacted from uh, the report, you know, the four categories. That is what's going to govern the redactions. And in fact, the special counsel uh, and his staff are helping us select the information in the report that falls into those four categories. But again, the report, uh, I'll be in a position, as I said, within a week uh, to release the report. People can then read the report. I've already promised the Judiciary Committees that I would appear uh, as, as soon as they're able to schedule a hearing after the report is released. So I'm not going to discuss it any further until after the report is out. Could you just explain for us, I understand that you are going to appear before the Judiciary Committee, but in that short period of time, it is very puzzling to me that the 400 pages could have been reviewed and the president states that this report is a complete and total exoneration. Who's factually accurate? As I say, it's hard to have that discussion without the contents of the report, isn't it? And that's why I'm suggesting that we wait until the report is out and I'm glad to talk to people about it after then and I'm already scheduled to testify about that. I appreciate that. In closing, I just hope that we as members of Congress are going to have the complete report and have discussions with you as to the accuracy of some of the statements. Thank you for appearing before us today. And will we, in closing, will we have the complete report? Are you, or are you going to be selective as to what you give members of Congress? You mean the unredacted report? Mm -hmm. No, the, the first uh, pass at this is going to produce a report that uh, makes these redactions based on these four categories, and that's something that I am hoping will be available to the public. As I said, I'm glad to talk to uh, Chairman Nadler and uh, uh, Chairman Graham uh, as to whether uh, they feel they need more information and see if there's a way we could accommodate that. Well, I do hope you can accommodate members of Congress who feel it's our responsibility to see the complete report, and I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you again for appearing. Thank you. Thank you. This is Roby. Attorney General Barr and Assistant Attorney General Lofkus, thank you so much for appearing before this committee today to discuss the President's FY20 budget request. Um, I would like to focus on the department's efforts as it relates to sex and human trafficking. Um, in the fiscal year 2018, the Depart Justice Department initiated a total of 230 human trafficking prosecutions, charging 386 defendants and convicting a record 526 defendants. Um, the department continued its successful anti-trafficking coordination team uh, initiative working with partners in the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Labor. Um, in 2018, these ACT teams saw a significant, um, saw significant prosecution results, um, including increases of 10 percent, 75 percent, and 106 percent in cases filed, defendants charged, and defendants um, convicted. I wear another hat um, sitting on the Judiciary Committee. 
Um, and through that committee's efforts in the last Congress, we passed several pieces of legislation working with the department specifically to close loopholes within the criminal code and um, make it easier for uh, the department to go after um, these folks that are um, exploiting children and uh, trafficking um, human beings. Um, this is modern day slavery. It's, it's important for me uh, as a member of this committee, and I suspect every member of this committee, um, I think I can say that um, um, we all want to see uh, sex and human trafficking eradicated in this country and want to make sure that your department has the tools that you need to do so. Um, the uh, director Ray was here recently. I directed some questions specific to this issue as well and would like for you to address for the benefit um, of all of us as we put pen to paper in um, our appropriations bills. Um, we know the successes, but where are the deficiencies and how can we on this subcommittee be helpful in making sure you have every tool that you need? Thank you, Congressman. Um, human trafficking is one of our highest priorities now in the department, and we have brought in uh, an exceptional uh, prosecutor uh, as an associate deputy attorney general in the deputy's office with a portfolio of coordinating the department's uh, efforts directed at human trafficking and are setting up task forces around the country uh, that, sh that she works with. Uh, I met with this uh, team uh, within the last month, uh, received a full briefing on their current activities, uh, and I've asked them to come back to me with a plan of action that could take it to the next level. And that could include uh, shifting some uh, resources within the department, uh, as well as seeking some uh, additional legislative uh, take legislative provisions that would uh, would help our uh, prosecutors. So uh, rest assured that I am very focused on on this, and we'll be back uh, to the committee uh, and the Judiciary Committee uh, with proposals as to how we could accelerate our efforts. I certainly appreciate that, and I, of course, was extremely disappointed that we were able to get a package of bills through the House by voice vote, um, only to see them fail in the United States Senate, which I know each of those pieces of legislation would have made law enforcement's job much uh, easier, I guess. Right. Um, and I do appreciate, too, all of the work that you do with local law enforcement to make sure that they have the tools and the resources that they need um, in order to combat sex and human trafficking and child exploitation. Most children now have access to the internet, um, and the internet technology affords children um, access to vast amounts of valuable information and endless sources of entertainment. Um, however, it also exposes children to certain dangers. Um, most worrisome children may uh, encounter, and oftentimes do, actual predators that use the internet to identify and um, lure victims um, through uh, chat rooms, instant messaging, um, and social networking sites. So if you could, with the short amount of time that I have left, and I can revisit this if there's a second round, but um, what does this DOG, DOJ's uh, budget request bill do to safeguard our children from these predators, specifically on the Internet? Yeah, well, we're, we're requesting uh, $81 million, uh, for OJP's uh, Missing and Exploited Children program. Uh, we have $30 million for NECMIC. Um, we have uh, $30 million for uh, the uh, ICAC task forces, uh, which are now in operating uh, in states. We have 81 of them operating uh, throughout the country. And then uh, the activities of the uh, Child Exploitation and Obscenity Unit in the Department of Justice. So those are the, sort of the three pillars of our effort, and altogether, uh, it's approximately $90 million. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for appearing before us today. I have understood for 
quite some time now that there are those in this country whose favorite pastime is attacking health care. But your decision as our new Attorney General to throw the weight of the United States Department of Justice behind an effort to get the federal courts uh, entirely to invalidate the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act as unconstitutional is breathtaking. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. It stands out, your decision does, for its breadth, its scope, its recklessness, and its lack of legal justification to invalidate the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. If your efforts are successful, millions of Americans would lose their health care. Tens of millions of Americans would see the premiums for their coverage skyrocket. One of our Republican colleagues in the Senate, uh, Senator Collins, uh, put it best when she wrote to you last week. Her letter was dated April 1st. Did you get her letter? Yes. Okay. And you saw that she wrote, your decision to pursue this course of action in the federal courts puts at risk not only critical, critical consumer protections, such as those protecting individuals suffering from pre-existing conditions, but also other important provisions of that law, such as the Medicaid expansion, dependent coverage for young adults to age 26, coverage for preventative services, and the regulatory pathway for FDA approval of biosimilar drugs, unquote. The Department of Justice's refusal to defend our law, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, is distressing because of the harm that it poses to the physical and financial well-being of millions of Americans, and also because DOJ's refusal appears to be driven by political considerations rather than health care policy discussions or sound legal arguments. Attorney General Barr, you're not a health care policy expert, but your department is taking the lead on attempting a massive overhaul of our American health care system. So I want to make sure we agree on a, a few of the top line facts. And let's go through a couple of quick yes or no questions at the outset. Number one, have you conducted or viewed an analysis to evaluate the effects of DOJ's litigation position to overturn the <coughs> ACA, uh, the effects on consumer costs and coverage? Have you done that analysis or have you reviewed one? Well, when we're faced with a, a legal question, we, we try to base our answer on the law. On the law. So the answer is no. And I, here's the thing. I can't imagine that you would take that kind of a dramatic, drastic action without even trying to evaluate the consequences for the American consumers, the people using the health care, the people for whom these premiums are paid. But let's start the process well, do, do of thinking you mean, through you that, mean in the event if, that if you're successful down. in this lawsuit that you're supporting and the entire Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is struck down, millions of Americans who currently receive health insurance coverage under the law are at risk of losing that coverage. Am I correct in that? I think the President has made clear uh, that he favors not only pre-existing conditions but would like uh, action on a broad uh, health plan. So he is proposing a substitute for Obamacare. The one that's going to come after the next election, you mean? Uh, the one that will come down if and when. Well, let Obamacare me be the one to inform down. you, should the law be struck down, p millions of people who get their coverage through the ACA marketplace would lose their coverage, and tens of millions more would see their, their premiums skyrocket. In addition, if you're successful, 12 million people nationally and 750,000 people in my home state of Pennsylvania who have coverage under the Medicaid expansion would also likely lose that coverage. Am I correct in that, sir? Do you think it's likely we are going to prevail? If you prevail, well, you're devoting scarce resources of your department toward that effort. Are you not, Attorney General? We're in litigation. We have to take a position. The answer is we, yes. We so take you're position in litigation. And, validate it. and if you succeed, that many people will lose their coverage nationally from Medicaid and 750,000 from Pennsylvania alone, right? I'm just saying that if you think it's such an outrageous position, you have nothing to worry about. Let the courts do their job. 
If you, well, I, my time is out. We'll come back to this. Uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you for being here today. For a couple of years at the end of the Obama administration, violent crime in America started to tick up. That means more robberies, more murders, and more assaults. I'm encouraged to see that the FBI's preliminary crime statistics that were released in late February show this alarming trend is being reversed. Uh, can you tell me what is the department doing that is working, and does your new budget add resources for fighting violent crime? Thank you, sir. The uh, violent crime, as I said in my statement, is, is one of our priorities and making sure we don't see a resurgence of, viol a resurgence of violent crime. Uh, our base amount in the budget is $4.3 billion, and we're seeking a $138 million enhancement to that. Uh, 120 would go toward reducing violent crime in uh, communities, and 18 would be to step step up our efforts against these transnational criminal organizations. The flagship, one of the flagships of our fight against violent crime is our Project Safe Neighborhoods. Uh, this is really a concept that's been around for a while under various guises, but fundamentally what it is, it is a, a strategy to focus on high crime areas that brings together the local community, the law enforcement, including federal and state, and also the various social programs and social agencies that, that run and fund programs that are meant uh, to, uh, to prevent crimes from occurring. And uh, they have had a tremendous uh, record. Uh, there have been studies showing how it has uh, suppressed crime uh, in the, where it's been deployed. Uh, we are seeking a $100 million dollars uh, to uh, to increase, uh, go from 20 million to 100 million, uh, to to uh, extend the Project Safe Neighborhoods program. Uh, we also are seeking 10.7 million to ex to expand ATF's NIBIN program, which has proved to be a tremendous tool in the fight against violent crime. This helps us identify firearms when they're used in crime and trace it back to particular individuals. Um, so those are, those are some of the, the main uh, initiatives we have underway to, to grapple with violent crime, and, and uh, so far it looks as if they're successful. I definitely agree. Our, our local police chiefs and sheriffs really support the project Safe Neighborhoods, and, and it's a great program with a, a high return on investment for helping reduce gun and violent crime in our, in our communities. Um, also important to the state of Mississippi is the, the addressing human trafficking. I know the state legislature has been working really hard on it. I know my colleague, uh, Ms. Roby, has um, asked you some questions. And I, I want to just talk a little bit about, I know the DOJ undertook a, a U.S.-Mexico bilateral human trafficking enforcement initiative to combat transborder trafficking. Uh, can you speak on this initiative, um, specifically how effective has it been in stopping trafficking across the border? Yeah. I'm going to have to get back to you on that, Congressman. I'm, uh, I really would have to talk to people to see whether it's having an impact at this point. Okay. Um, with, with my limited time, I'll jump over to uh, address some of the issues that, with the crisis that we have at our southern border. Um, I know we have an uh, immigration case backlog. There are over 820,000 immigration cases pending nationwide. Uh, with the past 12 consecutive years, seeing an increase in the number of cases. This year's budget request includes an additional $72 million to hire 100 new immigration judges. In your testimony, you mentioned that additional reforms are necessary to manage the backlog of cases. Uh, what reforms does the Department of Justice need to manage the case backlog, and what can Congress do to help you better manage the backlog? Right. Um, on Inauguration Day, there were 306 uh, immigration judges. Today, we have 424. Uh, one of the problems we had was the long lead time of hiring these judges, which we've now cut from two years to six months. So it only takes six months to onboard uh, an, uh, a judge. Uh, currently, there are 534 slots authorized, and we're asking for 100 more slots. So 
will be going up to 634 if that's approved. The backlog, uh, however, uh, we are, we're not making progress right now against the backlog. Our productivity is increasing so that, for example, in the first quarter of this year, uh, 19,000 cases were completed. However, during that same time, 26,000 new cases emerged. So we actually lost ground in the first quarter. As we bring on more judges, we're hoping that we're actually going to start working down that backlog. But uh, in, until we can get some control of the inflow, we're not going to be able to work down that backlog. And the inflow is a function of a number of factors. Uh, the problems with the asylum laws and applying the asylum laws uh, is one of the chief factors, the fact that they can be gamed. And when people are then released, the catch and release uh, situation, so when people are released into the country and, and never show up again, uh, that, that prospect is what's drawing people up from Central America and also uh, the fact that so many children are now included in that population. Uh, so we need to have reform, as the President has said repeatedly, we need to have reform of the immigration laws, uh, and we need to do all we can to discourage people from making the journey up to the United States by uh, uh, mechanisms such as uh, a, a border barrier system. Ms. Uh, thank you, Mr. Attorney General, and thank you, Assistant Attorney General Lofthaus, for being here today and uh, for your service to our country. Uh, I don't have a question about the substance or redactions of the report, um, but I do want to know, uh, was the President or anyone at the White House alerted in advance of your letter's release? Uh. The, the March 24th letter, uh, I don't believe so, but as I said, once the report is out, I'll be testifying and I'll be glad to discuss all aspects of the process and also explain the decisions I've made. Um, did you or anyone on your team consult with anyone in the White House in the crafting of that letter? Uh, are you talking about the March 24th letter? Yes. The answer to that is no, but as I say, I'm not going to discuss uh, this further until after the report is out. Okay, so they did not have to approve for you to release the letter, the White no. House. Thank you. Um, I do want to ask uh, my second question, um, and if you could answer yes or no, just in the interest of time, running out of time. Um, does the DOJ, uh, under the Trump administration, consider enforcement of the Voting Rights Act a priority. Uh, Chief Roberts himself has stated that voting discrimination still exists. No one doubts that. Yes, uh, we do. We consider voting rights a priority. Um, has the DOJ, the Civil Rights Division, brought any cases under the Trump administration to enforce uh, Section 2 of the VRA? No. But I would point out that during the first four years of the Obama administration, one case was brought, so. Well, according to your website, the Department of Justice, under Obama, both President Bush's and President Clinton had brought uh, at least over 30 cases um, in enforcement uh, of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Secretary Ross credits the Department of Justice's need to enforce Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act for the reason why a citizenship question is needed on the census. The DOJ has been enforcing the Voting Rights Act for over 50 years without the need for a citizenship question. Um, is there, what, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are that it's being litigated right now and I think oral arguments on April 23rd, so I'm not going to discuss it. Okay. Um, I wanted to also ask about zero tolerance policy. Do you agree with your predecessor's uh, zero tolerance policy memorandum issued uh, last year, April 2018? Well, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the zero tolerance policy. 
the zero tolerance policy is that the department would prosecute cases that are referred to the department. And the thing that caused uh, family separation was the referral of cases to the department that involved families with children. Uh, I th the administration, the president has put out an executive order, I believe, uh, saying that we're not going, that DHS is not going to uh, follow that policy. And as far as I know, we are not getting referrals of that type. But the general proposition that the department will prosecute cases that are referred to it uh, stands. Well, according to an article in the New York Times yesterday, uh, President Trump has been pushing to restart this practice of separating parents from their children. Uh, the term binary choice policy has certainly been getting traction. Is that something that you support? I haven't heard that. You haven't heard that? No. Okay. We can submit articles to your office. Um, are you aware of research showing that separation from initial stages to ongoing and long-term uh, is devastating and detrimental to children's health and development? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Do you, are you aware of any research that shows separation of families and children are detrimental to their health? I mean, I haven't uh, reviewed that research, but as I said, uh, the president has already put out an order uh, stopping the separation of families. So would you enforce and put forth policies of new discussions that have been happening about President Trump wanting to restart this separation practice? All I can say, I, I, I personally sitting here, I'm not familiar with those discussions. Would you support continuation of separation of families? I, I, I support the, the president's policy, which is we're not going to separate families. So you support that we will not separate families yes. anymore? Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Attorney General, thanks for being with us. And yeah, I'll just remind the committee, you know, we've heard a lot about the Mueller report today. 22 months of investigation, 2,800 subpoenas, $25 million in, uh, from taxpayers, 500 witness interviews, 19 lawyers, 40 FBI agents, and who knows how many warrants. And the conclusions were simple. No collusion, no obstruction. I remember when the uh, first letter was released, and uh, there, were, there were a lot of complaints then, Attorney General, that uh, you weren't releasing the summary soon enough. And then here today, I hear uh, it was too hasty, too quick. So now you've had time to review, your team's had time to review, you've indicated maybe within the next week we'll, we'll get uh, uh, the report released. So for the committee, is there anything new you've seen since the review of the entirety of the report that would change your conclusions? Um, no, Congressman. Uh, as I explained, my March 24th letter was meant to state the bottom line conclusions of the report, not summarize the report. And I tried to use uh, as much of uh, the special counsel's own language as I could. Uh, but they were just stating the bottom line conclusions, and there's nothing to uh, uh, suggest to me that those, you know, that those weren't no collusion, no state, obstruction. It's over. It's done. It's over. Well, the letter, the letter speaks for itself. I thought it did too. Well, I'll shift in a second because um, you know members of Congress have said they intend to ignore the public redactions and uh, and leak the full report. Um, would that give you pause if that were to occur? Someone's going to leak the full report. That's that's what we you well, know that's that what members of Congress have been saying. Well, that would be unfortunate because, you know, there's grand jury information in there that under the law has to be redacted. We've heard members of this committee today say that the American people deserve to see the full report. Um, and so even members of this committee have indicated that. The chairman of judiciary just this weekend said that, uh, uh, this is Chairman Nadler, certainly some of it would not leak publicly, that he has discretion and, uh, and the committee has a very good record of protecting information which it decides to protect. So General Barr, under, under federal law, does a member of Congress have the power to arbitrarily decide what portions of the special counsel's report they might release, redacted or not? Well, not if it, not if it violates the law, and we believe 6E does apply to members of Congress. So, you know, I, I it's, it's interesting because the, 
this whole mechanism for the special counsel, as I said, was established during the Clinton administration in the wake of Ken Starr's report. And that's why the current rule does n says that the report should be kept confidential. Uh, because there was a lot of reaction against the publication of Ken Starr's report. And many of the people who are right now calling for release of this report were basically castigating uh, Ken Starr and, and others for releasing the Starr report. Uh, I have already said that I think the situation here requires uh, me to exercise my discretion to get as much information out as I can. And I think these categories, uh, I think most fair-minded people would agree, are things that have to be redacted. Right. right. And um, I guess just thinking about the chairman judiciary, he, if he were to release or any member of Congress were to release the full report or redacted portions of the report, um, are they in compliance with law or in violation of the law? And what... I don't want to speculate about all the circumstances that would be involved. I, I don't intend this, at this stage to send the full unredacted report to the committee. So I'm not sure where he would get it. Okay, and then just if he got it directly from the council, that would be unfortunate. I, I doubt be. that would happen. And a quick question about subpoena. I'm not on the Judiciary Committee. My understanding is, though, they've issued a subpoena to you to um, release the full report. Um, would that put you in violation of federal law? I, if you in, were to comply in the current situation, I don't think I have the latitude to release 6E material. Uh, as to the other categories, as I said, I'm, I'm willing to discuss those with the judiciary committees. I, I want to try to accommodate and satisfy their interests, but at the same time uh, uphold the law. And right now, and there's been a recent case decided in the District of Columbia just, I think, within the last week on this, the 6E material is not releasable. Well, thank you for your um, the fashion in which you've handled this. I think you've been upright. You've um, you've ex been an example of integrity, and uh, and uh, and I know that you are going to abide by the law. And my hope is that all members of Congress would follow like like kind. So, thank you, Attorney General, for your good work. Mr. Christ. No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Attorney General Barr, for being with us today. On the question of obstruction of justice, you stated in your March 24th letter uh, that the Mueller report does not exonerate the president. Can you elaborate on what is meant by does not exonerate the president? I think that's the language from the report. Right, I understand that. Well, that's, that's a statement made by the special counsel. Right. I reported as one of his bottom line conclusions, so I'm not in a position to discuss that further until the report is all out. And then what is meant by exonerate is really a question that I can't answer, what he but meant by that. But as you sit here today, you, you can't uh, opine, after having read the report yourself, why it reaches that conclusion that it does not exonerate the president. That's right. Um, reports have emerged recently, uh, General, that members of the special counsel's team are frustrated at some level with the limited information included in your March 24th letter uh, that it does not adequately or accurately necessarily portray the report's findings. Do you know what they're referencing with that? No, I don't. I think, I, think, uh, I suspect that they probably wanted you know, more put out. But uh, in my view, uh, I was not interested in putting out summaries or trying to summarize because I think any summary, regardless of who prepares it, uh, not only runs the risk of, you know, being under-inclusive or over-inclusive, uh, but also, you know, would trigger a lot of discussion and analysis that really should await everything coming out at once. So I was not interested in a summary uh, of the report. And in fact, at the time I uh, put out my March 24th letter, there was nothing from the special counsel that wasn't marked as potentially containing 6E material. And I had no material that had been sanitized of 6E material. So uh, 
I felt that I should state the bottom line conclusions, uh, and I tried to use uh, Special Counsel Mueller's own language in doing that. Yes, sir. Uh, yep. I'm curious, um, did you feel um, that there was an obligation upon you or your office uh, to uh, prepare this four letter um, overview, if you will, rather than summary, uh, rather than having the special counsel's team do it themselves? Uh, Why did that happen, I guess, is what I'm trying to find out. It happened because the, the special counsel was providing the report to the attorney general, and I was making the decision as to whether to make it public or any part of it public. Uh, and uh, in my judgment, it was important for people to know the bottom line conclusions of the report while we worked on necessary redactions to make the whole thing available. Let me ask that. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, that's a matter of weeks, and I don't think that the public would have tolerated and Congress would not have tolerated at least knowing the bottom line. And as you know from your own experience, from a prosecutor's standpoint, the bottom line is binary, which is charges or no charges. Indeed. Um, did you contemplate having the special counsel's office help you with the preparation of your March 24th letter, or did you? Uh, we offered to have Bob review it before putting it out, and he declined. I didn't ask you about reviewing. I asked um, if you thought about having them help prepare the March 24th letter. I mean, they, they did no, the I report didn't after all. It. No, I didn't think about it. Why not? Because it was my letter. You said that the special counsel and his team were, were not shown uh, or did not review the March 24th letter, right? You offered to let him review it? Yes. Did you offer to anyone else to let... Uh, other people review it besides the special counsel? Not that I recall. I mean, outside the department? Anywhere? No. Yes, outside the department. Let's no. start there. Well, the answer I f I'm pretty sure is no, but... Uh, You're not sure? I am sure. Okay. I think I'll yield. I only have 15 seconds. Thank you, General. Ace. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Um, I'd love to talk to you about your uh, 2020 budget, but what is far more critical at President and it has much far re more reaching consequences to the credibility of our government is the prompt and full disclosure of the um, Mueller report. The current non-disclosure of that report has only worsened a pervasive distrust of government generally and of Mr. Mueller's investigation and your department's response to it specifically. This really started very early on in the investigation with excessive secrecy about exactly what we were taking a look at. Here is the supplemental uh, uh, memo from, uh, from the Deputy Acting Attorney General, and this is what drives the public crazy when they see something like this. This is what we have to try to avoid when we get into this. In your March uh, 24th, three and a half page summary of the report, you stated that you are, quote, mindful of the public interest in this matter and that you intend to release, quote, as much of the report as you can consistent with applicable law, regulations, and department policies. You know, you know of course, that on March 14th, the House resolved unanimously, 420 to zero, all members of this committee and House voting, that the full report be released publicly except where prohibited by law and be released to Congress unconditionally. Do you appreciate the importance of a full disclosure of this report, both personally and on behalf of your department? I appreciate the importance of releasing as much of the uh, information in the report as I can consistent with the law. Okay, well, let's get into that then. What specific laws, regulations, and department policies, as you've cited in your letter, do you claim require or justify you to withhold portions of the report? You've already talked about 6E. Okay, what else? Well, as I said, there, there are four categories uh, of information that are being redacted. 
I, I understand that, sir. Okay, uh, first, and one of those you said categories. You ask what else? The other one is um, we've asked the intelligence community to identify any information that could reveal intelligence sources and methods. The yeah, third, but what authority do you have uh, to 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 state that you have discretion to rehold, withhold? I get the grand jury side. That's six E. And by the way, you know as well as I do that six E also encompasses an intelligence. A committee except exception. So I, I assume you're going to say that that falls under that category, uh, that that there can be some release or withholding of intelligence specific information under your 6E category. What about the other two categories? What justifies you in in claiming the discretion to withhold that information? Well, are you talking about the intelligence? No, I'm talking about I'm talking about the other two categories. I'm talking about. Uh, ongoing prosecutions, but I'm particularly focused on privacy and reputational interests because it seems to me that that's an exception that you can just drive a truck through. So, I mean, you're the one that says you have the discretion to do that, and I'm asking you, where does your discretion lie? Where is your regulation? Authority? Because the regulation that uh, sets up the special counsel and also provides for his report to the attorney general and also what the attorney general can release specifies that it has to be consistent with the department's uh, longstanding uh, policies. And the department's longstanding policy uh, and practice is that if we're not going to charge someone, we, we don't go out and discuss the bad, bad or derogatory information about them. That's what got everyone outraged at what uh, FBI Director Comey did in the case of Hillary Clinton. Okay, so the regulation back to longstanding policy is what justifies that exception, right? In your, in your view? The, the regulation that says that any release has to be consistent with that. Okay, good. Um, let's go to 6E here for a second. Um, well, before I get to 6, 6E, are you maintaining or will you maintain any right to withhold any of the information in that report based on a so-called claim of executive privilege? Am I what? Are you going to claim that you have a right to withhold any of that report based on a so-called claim of executive privilege? Well, the, any claim of executive privilege would have to be asserted by the president. And he, the and president, as I said, as I said in my letter, which sort of speaks for itself, uh, he has said that he's leaving the decisions up to me. Okay. Are you going to claim executive privilege to keep any of that report back? Uh, as I said, there's no plan. On, I have no plan to do that. Okay. Um, do you believe that executive privilege applies to any broader uh, range of communications than specific direct communications from the president? Uh, you know, I would, I would have to review the latest opinions from OLC about the precise scope of it, but it's not relevant to me right now. And as far as you know, does it apply to any uh, communications by the president uh, before he was president? As, as I say, uh, it, I'm not sure what the, t the learning is in the Department of Justice on that. Okay. Um, you're aware that um, uh, some of the ex that there are exceptions under 6E under which you can, in fact, uh, disclose grand jury uh, material. Some of those are within your discretion, but many of those are uh, subject to a ruling of a court. Correct. What are they? Well, there's six, the 6E. Uh, there's five exceptions in 6E. Uh, that allow you to go to court to ask the court for permission to release those. It's up to the court to decide whether to release. Are you intending uh, to go to court uh, to ask for guidance and or direction and or an order uh, where you are uncertain whether you can in fact release or should in fact release materials? Oh, but I mean, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee is free to go to court if he feels one of those exceptions is applicable. The, the right is yours to ask for these the right exceptions. Is, well. Uh, why do you say the right is mine? Because you are the exercising authority under 6E. Yeah, but I think if the chairman believes that he's entitled to receive it, he can move the court for it. Well, I'll, I'll come back to this. It's your right to ask. So I'm asking what is your intention? My intention is not to ask for it at this stage. I mean, if, if the chairman uh, has a good uh, explanation of, of why 6E does not apply and his need for the information, I'm willing to listen to that. As I say, my first uh, agenda item here is to get the, pu the public report out, 
what can be gotten out publicly. That's going to be within a week. So my time's I will discuss, up. I'll, I'll come back. I'll, dis I'll discuss these issues in greater detail after that occurs. Ms. Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Attorney General, according to recent reporting, the Trump administration is pursuing far fewer civil rights cases, including hate crimes, police bias, and disability right cases than the Obama or Bush administrations. The DOJ's Civil Rights Department has started 60% fewer cases against potential violations during the first two years of the Trump administration than during the President Obama administration and 50% fewer than under the George Bush administration. Can you please provide me why that is happening and what are you planning to do to address that? Um, I'd have to see those figures and how they're broken down. I haven't seen those figures before. The areas that I'm familiar with, such as hate crimes, it's simply not true. We have an enviable record of prosecuting hate crimes at the, at, at, at the same or higher uh, rate than previous administrations, as far as I'm aware. I'd have to see what other what else you're talking about. Are you about. familiar with the data of what the percentage have they increased under the Trump administration? I think there, there are there are indications they have. Have they increased? Yes. Hate whether hate crimes versus the prosecution of hate crimes has. Hate crimes have they increased under this administration? I haven't seen any data, you know, going from 2007. So is it a priority? You haven't looked at the data. You're not aware of it. I, as I said in my my confirmation hearings, I'm very concerned about hate crimes and intend to vigorously pursue them. The data that I have seen have showed an increase going back to 2013. Uh, so I do. Th I agree with you that they have been increasing, but I don't. Th I have seen no data to say that it's it's different under the Trump administration. Um, Attorney General, I I want you to um, we use the word stay woke sometime in community activism where you are in tune with what's happening on the ground. Uh, I appreciate your tenure or your length of time that you've been Attorney General, but I can tell you that this is something that's very important, and I expect for you to be informed and aware of what's happening in this area. I wanted to follow up on a question that um, my colleague Car Carwright asked, because I, I really need to ask this question. I watched with uh, in deliberate intent of your answers when who do you report to, the President of the United States or to the people of America. You, during your confirmation, without duress, said you report to the people, but you just said when it came to the ACA ruling that you gave that the president was very clear that he opposed it and so let it work out in legislation. I want I you to be very, I want you I to be very, it. let me finish my question because that's what I heard. Maybe you need to clarify it. I want you to explain to me do you understand your role when you issue a statement abolishing Affordable Care Act that you as the Attorney General of the people of the United States have a responsibility to understand and support that decision not based on the policy of a President of the United States? It was clearly laid out the impact it would have and I want you to respond to that because that's what I heard, sir. Well, if, if, you, if you did uh, listen to my confirmation. I you, did, sir. Okay. I, I distinguish between th three different roles the Attorney General plays. One is in enforcement. Another is in uh, a policy role. And the third is in providing legal advice. And what I said then is that the Attorney General has the responsibility uh, to uh, – provide straight from the shoulder legal advice as to what the attorney general thinks is the right view of the law. Uh, so the, in this the, case of ACA, you felt it was the right decision under the law to issue that you support abolishing well, the Affordable Care Act. That's your legal no, opinion. No, did, you didn't let me finish, which is that uh, the, the first obligation is to 
provide your best view of the law. If uh, the president or your executive branch agencies that you're representing and have our stakeholders in the issue uh, disagree with that advice and, and want to pursue a different position, uh, then the attorney general litigating on behalf of the United States uh, should take that position if it's reasonable and uh, a defensible legal position, so, even if it's not the position that the attorney general would take if the attorney general was a judge. That's that's the position I stated at my confirmation hearing. So, also, so I did that not, we can be clear, sir, what you're saying is that if you disagree with the president, if your legal experience and your expertise doesn't agree and your president says something different, you're obligated to agree and enforce what the president says. Is that what you're telling me as the Attorney General of the United States of America? Well, it's is, that, is that your statement, sir? Well, it's the same as when we represent uh, and are defending a law of Congress. Sometimes we don't think the law is an original matter, actually. Uh, sir, we pass uh, laws. The President of the United States do not pass laws. Right, but I'm saying that uh, but but I feel that if there's a reasonable and defensible argument that could be made to defend a statute, we frequently do that. Sir, I'm so very the, concerned at this point. I am over my time, and I will come back at my second one, but I am very concerned with your statement. Thank you. So, Attorney General, in your testimony, you said violent crime has declined since 2016. But as we learn from the FBI, homegrown violent extremism has grown over the same time. What priority and resources have you included in the 2020 budget to counter such violent extremism? Uh, I don't think we uh, break out. Maybe uh, you can help me, Lee. I don't, I don't think we break out uh, the budget targeting that particular category of offense. We do not have a separate category for violent extremism, but we do uh, pursue all matters of violent crime together. And we have the $138 million and 135 new positions for our violent crime efforts. In the FBI, we're adding 47 new FBI agents to the FBI for a variety of uh, new initiatives. And among them is the FBI's work on violent extremism. Okay, it's important uh, for this committee to know at a certain point how many folks will be assigned to this or how many dollars will be assigned to it because it is a, an issue that uh, concerns all Americans, I believe, and we need to, to deal with it uh, in a proper way. Yes, Mr. Chairman, but you know the people who are on the watch for this kind of thing, whether they be FBI agents or U.S. attorneys pursuing potential cases, are the very same people that would also be looking at other forms of terrorism uh, potentially. So it's a little, it's hard to allocate exactly the dollars by that category. But uh, you know, obviously, it is a serious issue, and, and it's one that the FBI uh, is, devotes a lot of effort to. Well, as long as we know that the department, the, the agency is looking at it, is dealing with it, is taking it seriously, we can then work together on it. That's, that's the easier part. Mr. Chairman, if I can add a bit more. We do have in the FBI's budget this year, we have the $16 million for the FBI's participation in the National Vetting Center with other uh, federal entities, and that helps uh, the FBI look closely at individuals who may be coming to the United States. So we have that vetting money in, in the FBI. We also have $4 million in the Office of Justice Programs uh, on grants that go towards looking at extremism and domestic terrorism. Good. A few weeks ago, uh, the ATF Director Brandon told us that the Department's fiscal year 2020 budget request would result in ATF being forced to let go more than 300 staff due to increasing investigatory costs. As we seek to address rising gun violence in this nation, how can the department justify a proposal that would result in fewer resources dedicated to that goal? Well, let me just say first that 
I'm a huge fan of ATF. I think they're an outstanding agency, and I would love, you know, any money spent on the ATF is well, is well worth it. Uh, one of the common themes I hear from U.S. attorneys is how valuable the ATF agents are, and their technology is just outstanding in helping uh, to deal with gun violence and, and violent crime. Now, I am told that the statement made by uh, uh, Mr. Brandon uh, was actually based on, on faulty information, and we don't think that it would lead to a re We are asking for more money for ATF, and, and we don't think it would result in, in fewer agents, but you know, yeah. maybe Lee could help me with that. Sure. So I think very highly of the uh, ATF chief. I've known him for years. We've worked together very, very closely. We took a hard look at his budget. This year's budget will increase ATF by 3.9%. Actually, just about 4%. It does have increases for ATF. If you look back over the last three years, we've given an 8.7% increase to ATF. So we do think ATF is important. We are trying to support ATF. I know the ATF uh, chief is very concerned about his agency. His, his budget is susceptible to absorbing inflationary increases, and if the pay raise isn't funded or if, or if his rents or contracts go up, He's very concerned about that, and he's worried that it will translate into a loss of staff. I can tell you that we have looked at this year's budget, though, and at the 4 percent increase we're asking for, we don't think that translates into loss of hundreds of staff. And our commitment is that we want to work closely with ATF, make sure they have what they need. As the Attorney General says, any resources ATF receives I think will be put to very good use, but we're committed to working closely with the ATF folks to make sure they make it through the year. And again, a 4% increase uh, on this budget we think is a, a strong request for ATF, strong request for their NIVIN system, the $11 million for that. There's $4 million for their Spartan case management system. So we are trying to stand behind ATF in this budget. Well, I would hope that you can get uh, this issue resolved in terms of letting us know what really is going on mm -hmm. because as we put together the bill, and that will happen pretty soon. You know, I need to be able to go to the, this young woman on my right and tell her I need more money or, for, for certain agencies. And we can't do this if they're saying they're going to lose over 300 folks and you'll say they're not or that right. it's not. We need that picture cleared up. Absolutely, and we'll help you. Thank you. Ms. Satterholm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, of course, uh, the Department of uh, Justice has submitted a, a almost uh, thirty a billion dollars uh, of taxpayer dollars to use, and uh, I uh, want to remind my colleagues that that is what this pur the purpose of the Attorney General being here today is to talk about that thirty billion dollars that's uh, of taxpayer dollars going to be used. And um, unfortunately, I I see so many of the questions here this morning have gone toward uh, going toward a uh, grassy no conspiracy theory uh, regarding. Uh, uh, with the Mueller report. So I hope we can focus on the questions of having the Attorney General given of his time this morning to be here uh, to answer these questions regarding the budget. Um, as you know, uh, uh, General Barr, the DNA forensic science can speed the prosecution of the guilty, uh, protect the innocent from wrongful prosecution, and exonerate the wrongfully convicted. Um, Mr. Loffice, as in uh, prior years, the DOJ is proposing to use the fund available under the Debbie Smith program for DNA analysis and capacity enhancement along with, quote, other local, state, and federal forensic activities. So long as sexual assault uh, kit backlogs persist, I believe it's important that this funding be focused on DNA analysis and capacity enhancement. What are some of the, uh, quote, other local, state, and federal forensic activities that are funded under this authority? The National Institute of Justice, which is inside OJP, funds a program that strengthens the medical examiner and coroner systems uh, within our country uh, in a variety of ways supporting uh, forensics pathologists. And there's an alarming shortage of pathologists across the country. Opioid crisis has created a uh, additional strain due to overdose deaths. So one of the uh, focuses of our grant money today is on medical examiners and coroners. We also provide grants directly to forensic laboratories to encourage their uh, research. 
and the focus of the grant is to make sure that they have all the tools they need to have effective forensic uh, testing, and that has a real, real impact on the DNA backlogs across the country. If we can help them with their technology, we can really reduce the, the uh, backlog. So that's, that's one of our key things we are focused uh, on. We have $105 million in this budget for DNA-related programs, and we have $47.5 million to work on the backlog of uh, the National Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, and we want to make sure that that money is funded in the budget because it's very important to help the states and localities with the sexual assault examinations and the kits and make sure that is taken care of. So we believe we have a, a good, solid budget in this area to continue to work on both the DNA and the sexual assault kit areas. Let me switch over just a minute to um, opioids. Of course, that epidemic uh, continues to ravage communities in my home state of Alabama, and I know you realize that fentanyl uh, is 50 times more potent than heroin, heroin and uh, overdose deaths are on the rise with uh, fentanyl. Uh, the president has called this a national health crisis. It's impacting families um, and uh, the future of this country. Um, what would you say are some of the most significant actions that the Department of Justice has taken to curb the uh, deadly opioid epidemic that's plaguing the country currently? Uh, the, the whole, op just fentanyl or the whole opioid? Well, you know, both, or well, you know, either one that you want to address. Fentanyl, there's, rec there's recently been a development. As you know, most of the fentanyl and fentanyl analogs come from China. Uh, and the Chinese have agreed to schedule all fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, which would, which would make enforcement uh, much easier uh, in China. And we've, we would like to see a comparable action here taken in the United States to allow us to schedule fentanyl, keep fentanyl on the schedule, and all analogs of, of fentanyl. That's a very important step. Now, whether the Chinese action, uh, they actually deliver on it from an enforcement standpoint remains to be seen, but it's something we've been asking them to do, and we're very pleased that they've done it. But generally speaking, in the opioid uh, arena, uh, as you know, they're one of the main problems, and essentially the, the sort of the groundwork for this epidemic was set by the abuse of prescription drugs and the diversion of prescription illicit, illicit drugs. And uh, our, a lot of our efforts are devoted toward going after uh, health care providers and companies and others that uh, contributed to this by overprescription or permitting diversion. And so there's a lot of civil and criminal action around the country that is going after these bad actors and their task forces around the country focused on that aspect of it. Uh, and so uh, the first uh, effort is to contract the pool of people who are addicted by licit drugs. On the illicit drug front, we basically have a two-pronged strategy of going after the tox, the uh, transnational criminal organizations in, in Mexico, primarily in Mexico, uh, that are uh, responsible for most of these drugs coming into the United States and also the local distribution networks. And we have uh, the FBI, the DEA, uh, and uh, a substantial portion of our U.S. attorney's office is focused on dealing with these local distribution networks. And uh, so that's, that's basically the strategy. Okay. Thank you. Are you back? See, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yes. I think it was a... Congressman Chris was asking me about the letters and whether anyone was involved in the letters other than people at Justice. And I checked with my staff and was told that uh, just before the letters were out, after they were finalized and just before they went out, uh, we uh, did advise the White House Counsel's Office that the letters were being sent, but they were not uh, allowed or even asked to make any changes to the letters. But we did. We gave them. We notified them before we issued them. Mr. Chris, I'm sure would have asked you. Did they get to see the letter? However, I, don't, they, I think it, it may have been read to them. They did not get to see the letter. Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Mr. Attorney General, um, I want to get to some other items in the budget today because under current law. Background checks must be done within three days or the transaction is allowed to proceed regardless of whether a person is lawfully permitted to buy a gun. 
In my judgment, it is vitally important that background checks are done thoroughly. As we know, the results of incomplete information can be fatal. For example, we know that the shooter who perpetrated the Charleston shooting had passed a background check despite information that should have disqualified him. The House Passed Enhanced Background Checks Act substantially increases the amount of time allowed for a NICS background check to ensure that we close these loopholes. I'm concerned that until this bill moves through the Senate and onto the President's desk, that three days is not often enough time to evaluate a background check with questionable information. In your judgment, would fewer prohibited individuals be able to purchase firearms if this time period was extended? Would, the data that I have heard is that there are about 6,000 uh, of these uh, delayed responses where, where, where this, these default sales occur uh, after the expiration of the three days. And that when you go back and look at those 6,000, approximately 2,000 of those, about a third, are people that would have flunked the background check and their ATF goes out and gets the weapon, uh, retrieves the weapon. Uh, I think uh, it's fairly rare that, uh, well, I think that the Aurora shooter uh, may have been someone who got that default, uh, that default uh, sale that, you know, that uh, it was sold to them after the three-day period. So it does occasionally happen. Wait a minute. Um, occasionally? Didn't you mention 2,000, 6,000? Well, they're not all shooters. In other words, it, it does sometimes happen that somebody uh, Do does. Do you support extending the time period? I've had an interaction with so many people in law enforcement, and in many cases, three days is just not enough. Do you support extending the time period? No. I think that, you know, that puts a burden on a lot of people. Uh, Who may be buying a gun that shouldn't have a gun. Is that what you're saying? When you're saying it puts a burden on a lot of people. I, I, I think we're I'd rather put a burden on those who are doing the investigation than the I would put the shooters. emphasis. I would put the emphasis uh, on getting accurate records put into the system and, and make sure that we're getting all the records into the system. I think a far bigger problem is the, is the problem of of mental health. That is another elephant in the room. That's where all these school shootings are arising from. And we have to figure out a way of upgrading the NICS system so it actually helps us to detect people with mental illness that should not have, have guns. And I think we should be investing in NICS, the accuracy of the records, the obligations of states to put those records into the system. And, and make that a, a stronger, not a, a stronger system, one that we can rely on. That's where I would put the effort. I'm not sure what you mean by a stronger system. In other words, if one of your colleagues was doing a study and looking at a background check and said, I need three more days, do you feel that person should have three more days, two more days, six more days? Isn't it more important to get a good, thorough background check than limiting the office to three days? What I was saying is that the, the better job we do of getting the records into the system, uh, we won't have those three day, you know, that, that the level of a, of a three day default sale. I mean, you mentioned the, uh, sometimes uh, federal agencies are not putting the appropriate records in, as we saw, you know, with the Air Force situation. Sometimes state agencies are not putting uh, the records in, so there are gaps in the records. Let me go and on to a, the next question. That's a far question. more important thing to address. Let me go on to the next question. I do hope we can continue this conversation another time. Um, you have referred to the Violence Against Women Act as a bad idea and not in the legitimate interest of the federal government. These are investments that fund services for victims of domestic abuse and sexual assault that many of my constituents, including those trapped in cycles of domestic violence and looking for a way out, rely on. Under Republican leadership in the previous Congress, maybe I'll just wait a minute. The authorization of the Violence Against Women Act 
was allowed to expire despite bipartisan support. Thankfully, last week, the reauthorization passed the House, again with bipartisan support. During your confirmation hearing, you changed your position and supported VAWA's programs, pledging to familiarize yourself with the office, its work, and its program. I was delighted to hear that. So I'd be interested in knowing whether you support the reauthorization of VAWA, and do you support the House passed reauthorization bill? I do, I do support the reauthorization of uh, Violence Against Women Act. I'm not sure about the House bill and what's in it, but I, I do support the reauthorization of that provision. Let me just say that to the extent I said something against the Violence Against Women statute, I believe that that was in the context of it when it originally came up, you know, two and a half decades ago or 30 years ago, somewhere in that range. And what I uh, said was that, I, in that point, it was a substantive law uh, relating to the penalty, federalizing certain acts of violence against women. And that was eventually struck down as not having a sufficient Commerce Clause basis. I think that's what my concern with the Violence Against Women's Act was many, many years ago. It was a different kind of act. I fully support what we're doing right now on violence against women. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted that you support the current actions and I'm glad to know that there was good bipartisan support for the bill. Thank you, sir. Ms. Roby. Attorney General Barr, um, I mentioned earlier in my um, questions about sex and human trafficking, about the coordination between state and local law enforcement and how important that is in combating a, a number of different uh, areas of crime. And I wanted you to address, if you would, the um, overall reduction of state and local law enforcement activities grant programs by the amount of $583 million. Right. Well, I think part of that, a big chunk of that, is the reduction in the COPS uh, grant program, which was in the 300 millions, and we're putting it down to 99 million. But the 99 million does cover uh, the hiring part of the COPS grant program. So that translates into continued hiring of state and local law enforcement officers. The rationale for not funding the rest of COPS is that that is really, we feel, addressed in the funding that goes to uh, the federal opioid task forces and other task forces that the states can participate on and get in and get paid by the federal government, but they are part of a federal state cooperative task force. So it's really reorienting the spending toward those joint task forces versus funding purely state task, task forces. Lee, I don't know if you have something to add on it about the other grant money. Right. On the other grant money, there is the apparent reductions in the 2020 requests, one reason the grant dollars look smaller is that the Office of Violence Against Women is uh, proposed to be moved into a mandatory funding account where we think it can ensure that there's available money for violence against women programs, the $493 million we have for violence against women programs. There's also a uh, adjustment to the crime victims money. The obligation limit there goes down by about a billion dollars, but over the last two years, that's an area that's received eight billion, and it's received ten billion over the last three years. So overall, we still have over four point three billion dollars in grant programs proposed in this budget. Uh, the attorney general talked about the impact on on cops, but four point three billion dollars is what we're looking for your help on in supporting this year's budget. Okay, thank you. Um, the area that I represent um, is home to a, a large number of retirees. Um, I'm increasingly concerned about the elderly being taken advantage of by scammers and con men, um, especially given the rise of technology and social media. Um, so I'm sure you're aware of this problem, but the question is, um, what are you doing about it? And um, again, as always, what deficiencies may exist um, that you need more resources to help. Right. Um, 
You know, in the area of fraud, it's such a, a, a vast area of law enforcement that I have always felt it's important to focus on the sleeping giants. And when I was Attorney General last time, it was health care fraud, and that was, in fact, the sleeping giant. This time, I, I'm trying to focus on elder fraud, which is is suddenly awoken into a into a major uh, area of of criminality. It it arises because of a concate nation of events, including the you know the baby boomers uh, of the larger elder population, and the internet, new technologies, and uh, some of the increased loneliness that many uh, elder people unfortunately experience uh, later in life. And this is mushroomed. Uh, as I think anyone, uh, you know, whose phone rings over the weekend with these scammers knows, more and more of these uh, scams are, are coming along. We have a major effort in this area. We have an elder, we, we have, uh, have one person in the department in the deputy's office focused on elder care enforcement and the task forces that are being set up to deal with that. In March, uh, we had a big national sweep where we, uh, indicted uh, 200 defendants involved in these various scams. A lot of these scams are perpetrated with, wholly within the United States, but increasingly they are actually operated by international criminal organizations. A lot of them come out of uh, India. Uh, there are signs that organized crime, not, uh, not La Cosa Nostra, but other kinds of global organized crime are getting into these areas, they are so lucrative and the losses are substantial and people, you know, this is a population that doesn't have a runway to recover when they lose their life savings. So uh, we are ratcheting up the effort. At, we've had two annual sweeps with tremendous uh, results, but uh, I have set up a, ta a strike force to go after the large organized criminal organizations that we think are behind this. Thank you, and thank you again for being here. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Barr, I'd like to uh, finish up our discussion of the, the health care law. Our, our Republican colleagues in the Senate, and in particular uh, Senator McConnell, um, ha uh, have made it clear uh, that they have no in intention of introducing, uh, let alone passing, a, a new health care law a new health care plan for at least the next two years. And uh, apparently that, that view has been prevailed upon uh, the White House and the, and the President has accepted it. My question is, um, we've already discussed the devastating effects if this lawsuit wins uh, and repeals the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Given the, the position of the Senate Republicans and the President himself uh, opposing, uh, opposing any progress on health care for the next two years, if the Supreme Court of the United States were to grant credence to your position and sweep away the health care law, either in part or in entirety, would the Department of Justice support a stay of the effect of that ruling until Congress, the President, this nation can formulate a plan properly to supplant the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act? Well, you're asking me to speculate whether or not we're going to, the, the, the administration's position is going to prevail in court. Uh, and uh, beyond that, whether if it does prevail in court, when that is. Uh, and uh, also whether or not there'll be a legislative response if, in fact, we That's prevail. absolutely true. I'm asking you to speculate I'm on not, those, and you know. if questions are proper in this room, Attorney General, if you win the case, uh, will, you, will you agree that we ought to stay the effect of that until a new plan can go in place rather than strand all the people with pre-existing conditions and all the people that, uh, whose, uh, whose uh, health care will, will lapse uh, because of that ruling? Well, I, from my experience, the Supreme Court would, would likely deal with that in their opinion and provide some kind of uh, period uh, to, to wind it down. You want them to do it sua sponte on their own motion with no prompting from, from the Justice Department. Is that it? I didn't say that. I'd say, you know, we, whatever the administration's position is at that point will carry out from a legal standpoint. 
Well, I'm dismayed to hear that you're willing to drive our health care system off the cliff with no plan for replacing well, it. Well, I think the prem your premise that the Justice Department makes health care policy is simply wrong. We, we take legal positions in cases. Well, let me, I'm going to follow that up. Numerous reports have indicated that you, the chief lawyer for the federal government, and Secretary Azar, who is the lead on health care policy for our federal government, strongly argued against supporting the complete repeal of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Uh, uh, however, reports indicate you and Secretary Azar were overruled by acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney and the President himself. Now, at any point, did you convey either to Mr. Mulvaney or the President any concerns about either the, the effects of this lawsuit prevailing, if it does, or concerns about the dubious legal arguments in this lawsuit? And did Secretary Azar communicate concerns about the effects on our American health care system? Well, I'm not going to get into, you know, the internal deliberations of the administration on this point. I had ample opportunity to present my views and I believe that the final decision reached is a legally defensible and reasonable legal position. It is a position that prevailed in the district court, and it is a position taken by the four dissenting judges, judges, justices in the uh, NFIB case, which is that uh, once you do away with the mandate, the rest of the statute cannot stand. Are you citing executive privilege by declining to tell me about the discussions between you, Mr. Azar, Mr. Mulvaney? Call it what you wish. I'm not discussing it. You're, you're refusing to discuss it. All right. Well, uh, it's a decision that makes more extreme and, in fact, even contradicts. The decision to go forward with this uh, position it contradicts the DOJ's June 2018 position on the case, which was so controver controversial then that three of the four career attorneys representing the government refused to sign on to the briefs and actually remove themselves from the case. The American people deserve to understand if you and Secretary Azar support this lawsuit based on sound rationale or if it was just bald politics talking. I said I'm it requesting was, I that you submit this assertion of executive privilege in writing to this committee if that is what you're doing. Don't ask us to call, call it what it is. I'm asking you, if you're, ex if you're exercising executive privilege, we need to know it and we need to know it in writing. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. A lot so. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Attorney General Barr. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned um, cybersecurity. And being that the FBI is the lead federal agency for investigating cyber attacks, by criminals, overseas adversaries, and terrorists, the threat is incredibly serious and growing. Cyber intrusion is more commonplace, more dangerous, and more sophisticated. Targets include critical infrastructure, trade secrets, cutting edge R&D, identity theft, and as well as online predators, and et cetera. While my colleagues on the left are chasing shiny objects, I believe the American people want us to address the real physical and financial threats that exist in the real world. Can you elaborate on the growing threat and maybe provide some scenarios that we should be concerned with, uh, call out some of these uh, foreign overseas adversaries, and what is the FBI doing to transform itself and protect Americans? The, uh, the, you're correct that the, the cyber threat is a, is a serious and, and growing threat, obviously. Um, and uh, it's a threat to our, uh, it's a threat to our uh, intellectual capital, our, our uh, trade secrets, uh, and therefore our economic health. It's a threat to our national security. It exposes some of our fundamental infrastructure to disruption. Uh, we all know, have heard about the attempt to penetrate into election infrastructure, and the results of that could be devastating. Uh, the FBI uh, is receiving in this budget uh, 72, uh, $70 million uh, to, uh, to uh, upgrade and enhance uh, their cyber uh, tools and capabilities to deal with these threats. Uh, a total of 72 uh, million is in is in the budget. Uh, in terms of emerging threats, uh, as you know, we have a China initiative in the department because uh, China, we think, poses a very uh, serious uh, threat to the United States in terms of economic espionage. 
as well as classical uh, espionage. And uh, a lot of that uh, does use uh, cyber uh, tools and threats to the – involves cyber threats to the United States. And we're very focused on that as well as uh, not just the industrial uh, ex- uh, espionage but also – uh, the use of non-traditional collectors that the Chinese uh, are able to uh, marshal within the United States by co-opting uh, Chinese nationals who may be working in universities or laboratories and so forth. So it's a broad gauge threat, uh, and uh, you know probably our highest priority at this point in terms of uh, uh, dealing with counter espionage. If I can add one thing, we have over $750 million overall on our budget. The Attorney General mentions the $72 million increase. The $70 million is the FBI. The smaller piece, though, is worth mentioning. It's only $2 million, but it's really going to have a lot of bang for its buck. It's money put into the Justice Security Operations Center. That allows us to protect our own networks from intrusions and malware. So it's really important that the agencies protect their own networks. So. Well, I, I, we definitely appreciate the FBI's work on this. I mean, when, when our universities are, you know, coming up with cutting-edge research and development and technologies just to see them stolen by our adversaries, that they, they didn't invest any money in it, they didn't work hard to create it, and they take it from us, that's, you know, we're wasting taxpayer dollars. Um, when I first um, came to Congress, I was on the Armed Services Committee, and w- many of the um, uh, generals and admirals said one of their – you know, they, they have several threats that they're concerned with that keep them up at night. There's never just one. But one of them that was recurring was our cyber threats, knocking out our power grids, um, crippling us, our financial markets. And that would just create massive amounts of chaos. And so this, these are extremely important. This is, this is why I think the American people are interested in, you know, having this conversation and making sure the FBI is, uh, you know, using their resources and the protection and security of, of America. Um, and to know now that that technological gap between some of us and our, our overseas adversaries, where it was 25, 30, 40 years, just eight years ago, is now we're neck and neck. Um, that's, a, that's a truth uh, threat to our economy as well as our national security. So, um, Attorney General, thank you, and, and thank your team at the FBI for um, taking care and keeping America safe. Thank you. Ms. Ming. Uh, Thank you. And Attorney General, I want to thank you for clarifying the answers to my questions. And just want to confirm in relation to communication uh, with the White House or any of its team, you are answering that for both the March 24th and the March 29th letters, correct? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, You brought up a really important topic in my district, and I'm sure in many of my colleagues' districts, about elder fraud. Uh, Last year, uh, I had a piece of legislation signed into law by President Trump, uh, supported by Congressman Barton and Lance at the time, and uh, basically targeting and allowing the United States to uh, prosecute those calls that you mentioned that were actually coming from outside of the United States. Um, We were very happy to have the legislation signed. Uh, However, our local law enforcement, in our case, the NYPD, is having uh, a difficult time in terms of actually catching and figuring out who these perpetrators are. Um, I don't know if you have any further uh, ideas on how we can approach this, and just in general in the future, I would love to work with your office on this. Uh, Yes, I'd like to do that. Congresswoman, uh, that's exactly why I uh, set up a strike force uh, to be able, I think we need to get to ourselves to a higher level of sophistication in pursuing these crimes because although they might appear to the victim to be sort of, uh, you know, not very sophisticated, they are in fact very sophisticated and we have to get back to the people behind the scam and uh, we have to use all our tools, our treaty tools, our, cooperation, our cooperative agreements with the enforcement uh, authorities in other countries to get the information we need. You can help us in our budget on this. We have $611,000 in the Civil Division's budget in the Consumer Protection Branch. 
They do um, a lot of elder fraud work, and we sure could use that money in this year's budget to help the civil division continue its work in the uh, elder fraud area. Thank you. Um, my second question. Um, one, one other thing I oh, could yeah. say is that uh, I've asked to put together uh, uh, a number of additional legislative proposals that would give us more tools in this area as well as more uh, effective penalties. And uh, uh, I think that's being done and, and I will be proposing them. So I'd like to uh, provide them to you once we're done. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, just wanted to ask about sanctuary jurisdictions. As you know, last November, uh, Judge Ramos of the Southern District of New York said the Trump administration cannot compel states and cities to cooperate with federal immigration authorities as a condition for receiving uh, law enforcement funds, such as burn JAG. Um, in other words, Judge Ramos ordered the administration to award fiscal year 2017 funds without condition and became the fourth federal judge to rule against the administration on this issue. Um, the Department of Justice's 2018-2022 strategic plan states that you still intend to end uh, sanctuary jurisdictions. What is the plan? Uh, how do you intend to continue with these conditions for the fiscal year 19 grants? Well, you, you're right that we have lost in a number of district courts, but that's why we have appellate courts. So we are appealing those decisions. So you still intend to yes. continue to end? Okay. Thank you, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, General, um, just trying to close things out. Oftentimes when, when an individual or folks are in denial, closure helps. And there's a lot of unanswered questions. We've heard some here today. I want to just read a few quotes to you, and then let's go through a series of questions. Now presidential candidate Eric Swalwell said, who's a member of the Intelligence Committee, he said, in our investigation, we saw strong evidence of collusion. And he declared Trump an agent, quote, working on behalf of the Russians. Judiciary Chairman Nadler claimed it's clear that the campaign colluded, and there's a lot of evidence of that. And then Senator Lumenthal, who's a member of the Judiciary Committee, assured us last year that, quote, the evidence is pretty clear that there was collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians. Now, assuming they're speaking from a position of truth and not attempting to mislead anyone, do they have access to any evidence that the investigators did not have access to? Not to my knowledge, but I, I, I don't know what ac access they, they had. I'd be in a better position to address that once the report is out. To your knowledge, are they withholding any evidence from the investigators? Not to my knowledge. And if they did knowingly withhold any evidence from the investigators, is that akin to obstruction or something similar? I don't want to speculate about that. You also stated earlier that as you were preparing the, I think, the, uh, the March 24th letter, that you offered the Mueller team the opportunity to, to assist in that, yet they declined. Is that correct? Not to assist. We, or we or to review. What was your term yeah. there? To, to review it. To review. And, and yet reports indicate that there are a few disgruntled investigators a part of the team uh, since then uh, who, without names, under a shroud of secrecy themselves, are upset uh, uh, with your your findings, but your findings basically just restated the report. Is that correct? That's what I tried to do. So in they essence, weren't my findings. I was just trying to state the principal conclusions so of the, the report. So the letter just basically restated what was found in the report as it was given to you. As I say, the bottom line conclusions. And so in essence, they're just upset with their own findings. I, I don't know whether way. they're upset. Have, have you heard from any of the disgruntled Mueller investigators? I think the article says something like associates uh, is sourced to associates of third some, person too. If I might add, the people right. who worked on the Mueller report. I'm not sure who it refers to. I, I were the investigators or anyone assisting the Mueller team. Were they under? Uh, did they have security clearances? I, I, yeah, I would think so. Yes. So At least many of them did. I'm sure. And so it's it's possible that some of this information that's being leaked or uh, potentially going to be leaked is in violation of security clearances as well? Well, only if it were classified information. I haven't seen any classified information leaked. 
from that, that I would attribute to uh, the special counsel's office. Right. So this, I think, as you stated, it uh, it was it's multi-person removed from the source. It, it seems as reported, which I, I would hope this committee and, and no member of Congress would take this fact. Um, shifting cybersecurity real quick, and, and let me thank you. you've done a great job today answering our questions. And um, I, we did meet with um, Director Ray uh, last week, and uh, he's doing a fantastic job as well. Cybersecurity is something that I have a passion for and uh, been very aggressive in, in advocating for policy that allows for active cyber defense, allowing, uh, allowing the, the ability to defend your network outside of your network and not wait until in a passive po posture until you've actually been impacted. Um, your, your, your department has broad purview over a lot of this, and, and uh, I, would, I would like the opportunity to work with you, your team, or whom you might designate to, um, to see how we might better uh, advance policy. And the Cyber Fraud and Abuse Act really hasn't been updated in decades, and uh, it, it deserves good review and an aggressive stance. And um, again, I'd like to work with you, your team, or whoever you might designate as we look ahead. But thanks again for your testimony today, for taking time to join us, and for your good work. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Christ. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Bard, during the heat of the 2018 midterm election, uh, President Trump pledged to protect coverage for Americans with pre-existing conditions. Are you aware of that? Or were you aware of that? Yes. Are you aware that prior to the Affordable Care Act, up to 130 million Americans had some type of pre-existing condition that insurance companies could use to deny coverage, delay treatment, or limit access. I didn't know that number, but sounds sounds re reasonable. Yes, sir. Are you aware that the Affordable Care Act made discrimination against pre-existing conditions against the law? Yes. Do you agree that the Texas Affordable Care Act ruling, if affirmed by the Supreme Court, uh, would eliminate the law in its entirety which would necessarily include eliminating protections for pre-existing conditions. Yes, and the president's made clear that he, he supports uh, protection of pre-existing conditions. But pursuing this case would remove them. Is that, a reason, is that, is that a reason uh, to take a legal position? I, I mean, know. I hear, I hear, you know, I hear members of the committee basically saying, you know, you've taken this legal position that can have bad consequences, bad policy consequences. Yes. But, you, but, but as you know, as an attorney general, you take positions based on the law and you litigate them in court, and the court makes the decision. That is true. So, if this was such a, a hokey position to take, what are you worried about? What am I worried about? Yeah. You're acting like Millions the sky is... You, you, say, you say that the administration's position is hokey, and then you say the sky I didn't is... I say hokey. that. Well, Th those are your words, sir. Okay, so if it's not hokey, if it's not hokey, then... What am I worried about? Uh, I'm just I'm worried saying, about millions I'm a lawyer. I, I, you know, I'm not in charge of health care. I litigate on behalf of the United I'll, States. I'll try not to interrupt you. I would expect the same. Um, what I'm worried about are the people I work for, the American people, and the people you work for, sir. And, and it's our duty around here to look out for their best interests as public servants. And that's what I'm worried about. We're very, we're very worried about them. And the president's made clear that he, that he wants a strong uh, health care legislation. And he wants to protect pre-existing conditions in the event that the court accepts the legal arguments that we've presented. Worries about it so much so that you're pursuing a case that would take it away from them. Well, I'm, The irony of that is rich. Well, as I say, uh, you know, we... I yield my time. Thank you. Okay. It's the case. Thank you. Um, when you offered uh, Mr. Mueller the opportunity to um, review or uh, edit, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what your characterization was, uh, your three-and-a-half-page summary of his report, um, and he declined. Did he give her, you a reason why he declined? I didn't talk to him directly. Were you provided with a reason why the Mueller team did not want uh, I don't, to I don't, participate? I don't recall whether I was, 
whether a reason was given. So, so somebody offered to them that um, they could review your summary, make comments. It wasn't a summary. It was a statement of the principal conclusions. It wasn't a summary of the report. Okay. Your three-and-a-half-page letter, um, did you take it that there was no reason given back for their declining to do so? Did I what? Did you take it that there was no reason for them to do so? In other words, did they not tell you in any way, shape, or form why they declined uh, to participate in reviewing your three-and-a-half page I, letter? I, I don't recall whether that was related to me. My, my sense was that he understood that, that this was the function of the Attorney General. I'm the person to whom the report's given. Okay. You know, I'm listening to you on the Mueller report, um, and here's my problem. Um, you say in your March 24th letter that you are mindful um, of the public interest on this matter and that you will release as much of the report as you can consistent with applicable law regulations and department policies. You follow up with a letter of a few days later outlining four categories in which you are evaluating um, redactions. Uh, one of those categories is grand jury related to federal rule of civil proceeds, criminal procedure 6E. Uh, the other three are intelligence, ongoing prosecutions, and privacy reputational interests. And I ask you, what is the authority for that? And you track it back to department policies which do not have the force of law. They do when they're embodied in regulation. The regulation states. triggers back to department policies. Right. Which are, the regulation states that any disclosure has to be in accord with those policies. Do you consider That's that you have the... a regulatory mandate. Do you consider that you have the discretion as to how you apply those department policies? I have discretion. Okay. And so we're sitting here, um, from my perspective, um, with virtually unlimited discretion for you to redact uh, from that document. And maybe if I trusted my government more, I would be comfortable with that. But since I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. And I'm looking for some way in which your judgment, which is going to be the arbiter, as I understand it, of what the public sees, the arbiter, it's you, ultimately, um, can be overseen. I've suggested to you that under 6E, there are procedures under which you can go to court uh, to ask the court to give you guidance, direction, or an order. Um, I'm not sure whether you will do that or not. Well, I'm, the court is limited to the grounds stated in, in, in 6E. This is correct. Um, but you do have quite a bit of discretion to go to court under 60 if you, if you, if you review it. So that's, that's one category. The other category, obviously, is that there would be some function for Congress to exercise in its oversight responsibility under the Constitution, but I am not clear as I sit here today whether you envision a role for Congress in that oversight. Well, I think I, I sort of addressed that. Um, I, I identified the four categories and the team that includes the special counsel office lawyers are implementing that. Can you so, so, you know, they are the ones redacting what is 6E. Is there They're a, the ones who conducted the investigation. They know what is 6E and what is not 6E. That's why I'm dependent on the special counsel to identify 6E. And the intelligence community will identify the intelligence stuff. Do you and the lawyers who were prosecuting the cases and the special counsel's office uh, can identify whether there's going to be a conflict between releasing any information and a court order or an ongoing prosecution. And uh, the special counsel's office knows who the peripheral players are that they've said shouldn't be charged. So those are the categories. Does Congress have a role in overseeing your dis decision as to what is and isn't taken out of the, uh, out of the Mueller report? Does, is, is there any circumstances under, any, under which any member of Congress would have full access to all of the Mueller report, period, maybe under conditions, but is there any circumstance you can envision, sir, uh, where Congress, with uh, whatever protective procedures may be in place, would have access to the full report to review it. Yes, I did say here 
that once that report is, is ready for release, uh, I would not only give it to the chairman of the Judiciary Committees, but I would talk to them and engage with them about what additional uh, information they feel they require and whether there's a way of accommodating that. As you, I'm They sure have to give you a reason? What if they just want to see the report to satisfy well, themselves of, of your exercise of discretion? Well, it, well, it, it depends. Uh, take, you know, classified information. I can envision... You have an intelligence committee for that. I, I, well, if you let me finish, I was saying I can envision a situation where under appropriate safeguards, that information would be shared. I also think there may be under appropriate safeguards a way of people verifying... Uh, that these categories were not abused and that the information is bona fide uh, privacy-related information and so forth. And I'm willing to work with the Judiciary Committees on that. But I'll have to say that until someone shows me a provision in 6E that permits its release, the Congress doesn't get 6E unless there is a provision that permits it. There's plenty of discretion in 6E for you to make that judgment. Where would you find that? Um, judicial proceedings akin to judicial proceedings if you want to go there I'm sorry I'm really out of time but there, there are a number of interpretations you can make of 6E that would give you uh, some pretty good discretion to come up to Congress the, under limited circumstances possibly uh, to be able to satisfy somebody in Congress who gets to see the entire report and who gets to oversee you Ms. Lawrence Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, publicly thank you, um, Attorney General, for your support of Violence Against Women Act. Um, it is long overdue, and I do look forward to your support of that law. Also, I look forward to your release of the report next week, and uh, for it to be timely, and I look forward to the things that you're saying. I just wanted to follow up to the previous question and let you know that under the Hate Crime Statistics Act of 1990, the FBI is required to collect and report hate crimes from state and local and federal office. And in 2017, the most recent um, data available, the FBI, rep FBI reported a 17% increase in hate crimes on race, religion, and sexual orientation. And I do encourage you to look at those numbers. Can I, can I say something? Yes. Uh, you know, I'm very concerned about hate crimes, and, and one of the priorities we have is to make sure that those numbers are not understating the level of hate crime. As you probably know, mm -hmm. local jurisdictions are very spotty in the extent to which they report hate crimes. There's some major U.S. cities, major cities, mm -hmm. that say there's zero hate crimes. Uh, so as you, as you may know, the FBI is engaged in a major initiative to try yes. to, uh, to make sure that these jurisdictions are accurately reporting and are converting their cr 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 crime reporting system into a new system that actually will have a field uh, in the system for hate crime. So we're hope hopeful uh, one of the things we have to do is get a better handle on the actual level of this, where it is, and so forth, and that depends on reporting, and we're trying to improve that. And taking those who committed to trial. Yes. Um, I thank you. That's a lot better answer than before. I want to talk to you. I was previously a mayor before becoming to Congress and COPS grants, which I used as a mayor, was uh, it just really um, – an amazing support that we have in our cities across the country. Unfortunately, um, there is cities who are being told that they're no longer eligible. This is creating when we know after the economic downfall, a number of cities reduced the number of police officers. And although they're not back at the regular at the amount they were before, they were able to increase that deficit with cops. Can you tell me what was the thinking, and what is happening with the cops grant? And you're going to hear more more about this because this is a critical funding to cities. Right. So, uh, as I understand it, the the cop grants had two components. One was the hiring of police officers, and that was running at 99 million, and that's mm -hmm. what we're asking for in this budget, which is to continue that mm -hmm. program. 
The other money related to the funding of state and local task forces, and I think the thinking behind uh, not asking for that money was that we would rather have to, uh, support joint federal, state, and local task forces, where the money does benefit the state and locals because when they participate in the joint federal state task forces, they're paid. Uh, but uh, the idea was let's put our effort on these joint task forces rather than putting the dollars. I, I ask that you look at that because that's critical. And those joint task forces on human, human trafficking and drugs uh, trafficking has been extremely beneficial in cities. Uh, the other question I want to ask is about the decision of the president's budget to transfer community relations services to the Civil Rights Department. And that, that activity, the proposal requests minimum funding and staff to be dedicated to the functions of community relations. Attorney General, you know so many of the issues that we have had in riots and civil unrest. We have deliberately infused money into the community relations. In doing this and consolidating, there are going to be reductions in staffings of the civil rights and um, community relations initiative. How do you ensure that the Civil Rights Act is fully enforced with these cuts to the budget? Right. The, this, I think, is the second year in a row this is being proposed. Uh, my understanding of the rationale is that currently the CRS has, I think, maybe 50 positions, and they're spread in small <coughs> offices around the country, sometimes mm -hmm. just one or two people. In, in whole areas of the country. And I think uh, the idea is that given what they uh, are actually involved in, it would be more efficient to have them co-housed with the Civil Rights Division and have a reservoir of, of people, essentially, uh, I, think, I think 15 <laughs> slots, uh, of people who could be deployed when there is a situation that needs their services rather than maintaining this whole nationwide structure with very small Mr. offices. Attorney That's the rationale yes. for it. I really need you to do a deep dive in that because this proposed move undermine the express terms of Title 10 of the Civil Rights Act by inserting the civil, I mean the community relations into a division that, that you're not supposed to have it in a division that litigates and investigates. And so to me, I see this combining is a direct attack on Title Title Ten, and it's also in it is not in compliance with combining those two together. And so, this is an area that I will be looking at very closely. And the funding of doing that is not something I would support. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Attorney General. Before I close, just going to make a very uh, personal statement. Like so many people in this house, I grew up politically in the 60s. That's where I developed a lot of my feelings about things in our great country. And we were a group of people trying to make the country even better than it was, knowing that it was great at all times. And it's still great. But whenever things got rough with segregated housing, or education issues, or civil rights issues, or voting rights issues, we knew there was always a Justice Department we could turn to. We always knew that that Justice Department would defend the law and therefore defend the people and somehow come through for us. It's very troublesome to see a Justice Department against the law of the land when there are many people, many people, who if not liking the whole law, certainly like the pre-existing conditions provision, the ability to keep their child on, the, on their uh, plan till that person's 26. And so I hope that if you take something from here today, since we took a lot from you and in information, is to maybe look around and realize or pay more attention to the fact that we lean on you to come through for this country. And when we see you taking sides against the law of the land 
or taking sides that uh, we may not think uh, is in the best interest of the American people, it troubles us. Nevertheless, we want to thank you for your testimony today, for your patience with the time, and uh, I think uh, I want to thank my committee members on both sides, Mr. Adderhold. It was a great hearing, great attendance, and I'm sure your picture is somewhere in the files today. Thank you so much, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Meeting is adjourned.
Subcommittee will come to order. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a hearing to which the appropriate official shows up. It's an inside joke. <laughs> this morning, we welcome the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Christopher Ray, in his first appearance before the subcommittee to discuss the FBI's fiscal year 2020 budget request and related issues. Much of your budget falls on the defense side of the ledger, but the President's efforts to increase defense spending do not seem to include your critical agency. Your fiscal year 